Welcome to another episode. I believe this is episode 12. Welcome to episode 12. I am Garrett. I'm Katie. So uh, I'm going to give right out of the gates a trigger warning. This is a heavy episode. We're doing something a little bit different than our normal ADHD content. Kind of like we did last week. We talked about tarot last week. Yeah. Um, Continuing with a little bit of a spooky season. Yeah, trying to, although this um, was supposed to be just like a spooky episode and turned out to be real heavy and dark. So um, we, I am going to mention various types of abuse. And if, so if that's too much, you just may want to skip this one and pick up with us next week. Um, and I'm I'm going to try not to get into too much like detail. Yeah. yeah. Or show a lot of photos because I, I just feel like it's overexposing, like something that's already traumatic and awful for people. So yeah, um, I'm going to try and communicate things, but not be overly graphic. Um, and also stay tuned because there may be some bonus content on this topic coming up in the future. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and I'm also going to give the heads up. I'm going to try... To give some background and context and not jump around too much, but there's just like so much to cover that I'll try and be organized, but it might be a mess. <laughs> so today we are going to talk about uh, the Willowbrook State School in Staten Island. Um, for those unfamiliar, Willowbrook is, it's an infamous place. Um, there's a lot of like urban legends surrounding it. Um, I believe it was the inspiration for American Horror Story Asylum. I think that's like where they kind okay. of got that plot, which I haven't watched because I am too much of a baby. Yeah, same. Uh, yeah. <laughs> American Horror Story. Uh, not cut out for it. Like, I do appreciate that they're very upfront with the title of the show. Yes. There's no question at any point in like, time. Like, is this scary? Right. What yeah. it was about. So right. I never had to try to watch it and yes. then find out that I had to sleep with the light on for three weeks. Yeah, I tried a couple episodes and I was like, ooh. No, nope, I'm not cut out for this. Some of the previews even of that first season, <laughs> yes. I was like, mm, oh, uh, hardest of passes. Yes. I uh, hate it. I hate it real bad. Yes. Because there's like, I just don't do well with like horror movies. PK and I were talking about this the other day. Yeah. And it's it's the sort of thing where like if the preview... Scares me. Yeah. There's like, I, I can feel it right away when I'm watching a preview for things. I'll just look away. Like I yep. will just not watch. I can tell when the jump scare is coming. I want no part of it. I do that like, I'm not listening. I can't hear this scary preview. <laughs> and we'll literally like sing over it so that I can't hear it. Because I do People spend a lot of time. Movie theaters. <laughs> <laughs> I spend so much time like by myself. Like my spouse travels for work. So I'm in like this old house by myself a lot of the time. Totally. And no, thank you. Oh, Don't for want to sure. be scared. <laughs> yeah, I live on the second floor of my apartment building, um, but that doesn't stop me from convincing myself that somebody's going to climb the walls. There's obviously somebody somehow. in the window, so <laughs> how am I supposed to live like this? <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll climb up the microscopic Juliet balcony yeah, that is, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, only holding on by like a staple Thread. at this point. <laughs> Um, so I first heard about Willowbrook, um, from a documentary called Cropsy, which you can now see on YouTube, uh, came out the, the info on YouTube said 2010, I can tell you the fashion in this documentary was solidly the early 2000s before 2010. Um, and when I, I watched it. I called my grandmother because my grandmother's from Staten Island. I was like, hey, have you heard of this? She actually worked there and I had another family member that also worked in the facility, uh, which I was not aware of. Um, So at one point, Willowbrook was the largest institution. I saw some places said in the United States, some places said in the world at this time uh, for people with developmental disabilities. And what time is that? Um, It was... In operation from 1947 until 1987. Oh, so that's kind of um, late that it started. Yes, yeah. especially like for the type of institution it was. Yeah, I so, feel like a lot of them you hear like, oh, they opened like in like, yeah, like 1890 or yes. whatever. Yes, and like. that was a big era of like where institutionalizing people was like right. the go-to. Um, so, so, yeah, this is post-war. Yeah, this wild. it's late and and... There were buildings on the campus that were used for, like, 
tuberculosis recovery, like okay. there was a quarantine area. So it it went through a few different versions post-war until it, it landed on this. It was, I think it was actually supposed to be for children, but there were adults and children's ha- children housed okay. in the facility. Um, and when I say developmental disabilities, there were also people with physical disabilities, with mental illness, you know, the umbrella. And of course, I'm, I'm going to try to use n- like non-ableist terms when I'm referring to people. These are not the way. I mean, I'm going to call oh, it developmental sure. disabilities, but the way that people were referred to was just like horrific in some of the things I read. So totally. um, the umbrella of diagnoses that fell under that was broad. Um, there's a it's on a sprawling, secluded, like wooded campus. It's on 375 acres in Staten Island. Like it's an enormous campus. Wow. Um, so one physician who worked there, I don't know how big an acre is, but that sounds like a lot. That's a lot. That's a really big and, and really was kind of remote from like any connection to the outside world. Like it really was kind of insulated from the outside, which yeah, sounds like that's why they used it for these things. Totally. Um, so one physician who worked there called it a human warehouse. Oh, um, Bobby Kennedy was there in the late sixties. He called it a snake pit. Um, oh my God. there was, there was in the documentary, in the Croftsy documentary, they were talking to, and I don't remember who it was. I want to say he like works somewhere for the municipality. He kind of set up the circumstances to this as like Staten Island has the dump for New York city. And it was also a place which was notorious because it was, like, heavily wooded, but also in proximity very close to New York City. Like, a lot of mob, like, crime, um, murders happen there. He was like, so it was just on kind Staten of... Island on Staten Island in general, Island. you mean? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, so he said, like, you know, Staten Island has always kind of been treated as, like, the dump for New York City. And Willowbrook is, like, where they dumped people and left them. Oh, my so God. So people were just, like, I really left there. Left yeah. There. yeah. Um, there's a lot of urban legends surrounding it, um, you know, about like escaped patients. There was a lot of mm. tunnels under the the facility. Um, so there, the name Cropsy was supposed to be this escaped patient who, you know, was living in the tunnels underneath, satanic rituals. Oh, of um, course, the 80s. Right, right. All of, all of that. Um, but the, the documentary itself was actually about a former employee who was squatting outside the campus and was targeting children and young people with developmental disabilities and, and killing them in the 80s. There was like 15 people. Oh my kids God. That went missing in Staten Island. That this he, is wild. Yeah. So, so like. So there, he was kidnapping the actual patients of Willowbrook. So or they. just anybody. No, these were like kids that lived on Staten Island, like in the neighborhoods. And he was like luring these kids. And I guess like, you know, he was, he had a, a lot of mental. I know his mother I want to say his mother may have been a patient there. He wound up working there as an adult and then the facility closed and he and a lot of other people were like squatting on the grounds and living on the grounds. And then he was then targeting kids in the community that had, you know, various oh types of God. developmental disabilities, um, which is just like horrible. But that's what the documentary was about. Like this guy who was gotcha. a, really a serial killer. So as much as like I'm saying these are urban legends, there was... <laughs> some validity to some of these urban right. legends. Right, he just wasn't an escaped patient. Right. Right. He was an esca- a former he employee who... <laughs> should have been a patient somewhere. Yes. Have treated his mental illness. He should have been treated by someone for something. <laughs> but he was not um, being treated by Willowbrook and then escaped. Correct. Okay. <laughs> um, Whoa. The, the New York Times had a quote from... Um, this same physician that I mentioned called it a human warehouse said the sadness of the place was overwhelming. So a little bit of context for what was going on at this time. Um, In the sixties, disability advocates began pushing for those large institutions, which were really like archaic at that point um, to close and to shift to a group home community based atmosphere structure. Um, So, before that push in the 60s, this was like a hospital where you were in like a hospital room. Like a sanatorium. Okay. Or, you know, like a when you think mental institution, a asylum. like Girl Interrupted um, versus, or was Girl Interrupted more of the community based? I think Girl Interrupted was more of a, like, um, like one floor of the cuckoo's nest. It was more of like a short term 
Okay. To me, it seemed like it was more of a church and like crisis based mm. setting. Okay. Um, that was institutional, but this was like all of. So if you think of any stereotypes of asylums, which I'm like putting in quotes, yeah, in old timey asylums is what this okay. was like. Massive, huge building. It was supposed to hold four thousand people, and they had like upwards of sixty three hundred people living in the building. Wow. Super overcrowded. Um, and so then, um, you might answer this later, but so then the community based stuff was like, um, I guess what I would think of now is like, perhaps like group therapy or like art things. Yeah. Um, Like where people are not isolated from, let's say neurotypical people. Okay. Um, more of a community based where you do see people going into like job placement programs and getting like training for things occupational therapy physical therapy so whereas like in the 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 dark days yeah the quote-unquote traditional sanitarium sanatorium um they were just trying to like zap your brain or whatever horrible treatments right they had right it was there was no trying to like fix like a hospital like i just want to fix your broken bone and then send you on your way right or lobotomize you and be done with you okay um so there there were advocates at that time because you figure the 60s that's a lot of upheaval a lot Mm -hmm. of change going on so there was push from these advocates to this is also a time where there's a lot of civil rights changes going on. So they were they were advocating for a shift out of this institutional structure. Um, and there really wasn't an infrastructure to take care of people with disabilities, to be educating them. Like we were just saying, I mean, it's like the infrastructure just wasn't there yet. And they were pushing for that. But a lot of people were still being housed in these large, cold, institutional, awful settings. Gotcha. Um I do have a little side note. Uh, this is also the same 1960s <laughs> in which Nelson Rockefeller was the governor. Uh, shout out to the Rockefeller drug laws. And he also enacted stop and frisk. So just to give an idea, um, I don't want to spoil anything. There winds up being a federal lawsuit in which he was listed as the first defendant. So anyway, um, <laughs> they were trying to phase out these places where people were not treated like people, ultimately. Okay. So there was a lot of issues with Willowbrook. Um, It was extremely understaffed. So ratios, depending on the level of care, should be between like two to five patients to one carer. Okay. Uh, It was like 50 plus to one. Oh my God. In some situations I saw, they were saying there was like 200 people on a floor and there was one person taking care of them. So extremely understaffed, also underqualified staff. I was going to say, like, I would be terrified to be that, that, I guess, nurse. Right. Probably, because it's not a doctor. (laughs) And underqualified, so I don't think they were even getting clinicians working in this Well, I mean, they had a serial killer there, so. (laughs) Correct. Um, There was talk that really a lot of the staff was involved in criminal activity, so... There was basically, because they were on such a secluded campus, it created its own hierarchy, social structure. There was like a black market Mm. where things were being sold um, and also just created a lot of crime in the facility. Um, Administration was also corrupt. So when there were families of these patients pushing back, you know, they were labeled as like troublesome people and were isolated further. Um, so, and this was, is this a privately owned or privately run hospital? So it's actually a state funded facility. Wow. So in it, and then you, and what's terrible is like, there's all these things where people are talking about the staff, but in addition to all this like terrible staff, you also have like staff where people are like desperate to help and just can't fight the man and like improve these conditions. It was like, you know, one person trying to swim against a current. Yeah. There was one story. There was a woman who actually um, started writing in the Staten Island. What's the name of the paper? The Staten Island Advance. Um, Her name was Jane Curtin, not the actress. Um, And she was writing articles about the conditions and brought in a photographer. And they were, like, trying to, like, expose what was going on. Um, Oh, God. I'm so terrible for her. I'm so worried about how terrible this story is going to end. It's awful. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) So, like we said, um, extremely overcrowded. Um, Wait, what, what happened to Jane Curtin? Do we know? 
Um, I mean, she's still writing. She was not. She was not the most successful person at exposing what was going on. Okay, I thought I thought for sure you were going to tell me that like she got killed. Oh and no! Oh no! Killed. Oh no! It was okay. not that dark. It's dark, but like not that okay. dark. Um, but buckle your seatbelt because it's going to get worse. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> I I have also heard stories of the beds being so close together that you could just walk across the room without touching the floor because they just had beds like piled oh, in goodness. there. Um, you would, I mean, you can go online and I, you can Google it, but again, like trigger warning, it's, it's just, it's just really upsetting. Mm. Um, I tried to share some pictures where it didn't have people's faces in them because it just feels yeah. kind of gross. Um, but there's a lot of pictures of like cribs where you just have like six kids, like piled in a crib sitting Aww. together that I, I, photos of people just like naked wandering. Um, it was extremely underfunded. We know that cyclically there are periods that i'm putting this in quotes austerity measures um there were significant funding cuts especially in the early 70s when the um economy was not doing oh, yeah. well the oil crisis and right. vietnam and- early 70s and late 70s were not good financially and there was a lot of budget cuts that happened to willowbrook during this time and like less severe i don't have the stats which i should have gotten um but intense budget cuts um the conditions were just really bad, um, just filthy. Like residents, the building, there was a lot of like not enough beds, not enough clothes. The bathrooms weren't in good working order. Like the facility itself was just in like disrepair. Um, and because the understaffing was so severe, you just didn't have people who could like dress, feed, bathe residents, let alone teaching and enriching, right. Anything nurturing. To, like, yeah, provide any right. sort of uh like quality of life or like what you would expect to help somebody so that they could potentially build a life for themselves outside of or or phase into like institutionalized environment independent living right at some point exactly um it was just how to count coins or something even right like you can't no i mean especially children who are raised in that like totally and there were people i mean you would talk to that they would interview who had been there for like 20 years i mean just like really, f- like full blown. Especially neglect. yeah, in like nineteen forty six, like how many of those kids were just there because they had pol- polio? Correct. Yeah. So there is, and that's why I'm saying the umbrella was very broad, right? Um, so they really did like leave people to rot. They used seclusion cells on oh. children. Um, illness was rampant. So I bet. Yeah. yeah so much for the tuberculosis quarantine wing. Right. <clears throat> so. There was a lot of communicable illness, but there was also like pneumonia, which they really attributed a lot of that to either people who have limited mobility that maybe right. aren't being moved around and are laying in bed a lot. Also, when you have people that have some level of physical disabilities, feeding themselves can be a problem. And when you're understaffed mm-hmm. and you're supposed to be spending 20 or 30 minutes sitting with somebody helping them eat and you're spending two or three and they're aspirating food, you have a very high level of pneumonia, high rate of pneumonia. Yeah. Um, Plus, you said people were not dressed. So, you know, you're not dressed for the weather. Like, you know, what right, it matters. Right, right. Like, you do need to wear Right, like your body the, should yeah. still be insulated and, right. and warm. <laughs> um, God. So hepatitis was so rampant. A doctor who had who worked in this facility with funding from the Department of Defense decided to use Willowbrook as a case study, basically, for the spread mitigation treatment of hepatitis. So there was a 100% infection rate. Oh, my God. Between community spread and, in addition... Uh, intentionally injecting people with the virus, intentionally exposing people oh my God, to it's like someone who's infected all over. Again. Oh yeah, but uh, I mean, they would expose intentionally expose someone to someone else's like excrement to see how what the the rate of transmission was in the. I mean, like fully experimenting oh on God. people. So one of and the to things to do that to somebody who might have a cognitive delay and they don't understand or that can't they're... communicate and don't have a cognitive delay. Right. I mean, yeah, like if somebody was like a nonverbal autistic or something right. like that or had never been taught how to speak so they don't right. understand how to communicate and like the idea that like you're you're putting somebody through something who either doesn't know that they shouldn't be treated that way or can't object. Mhm. 
let even taking away the consent issue. Yeah. But like, oh my god, just horrifying. I can't imagine like, oh, yeah. So they they had like a, I guess there was a wing specifically where they did a lot of this this testing. We need to defund the Department of Defense is what I'm learning here. Well, I've been saying it for petition. years, but <laughs> they don't need a trillion dollar budget. Correct. Obviously. Correct. <laughs> Um, if you think they're done doing this, guys, you're not paying attention. Yeah. They're still doing it. They've for just sure. figured out other ways. Yeah, we just don't know about it. We'll get like a news brief in another fifty years. Like yeah, Clinton was it Clinton who apologized for MK Ultra? Um, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> it'll yeah, be yeah. like that. Oh, sorry, sorry about all those. Uh, <laughs> hey, those remember that Iran Contra scandal? <laughs> sorry about that. Guys. Sorry, we melted your brains with LSD and Whoops. lied to you about it. Um. So they would contact families and say, like, hey, you know, we can put them from this facility into this like this other building. There's a short wait list. And then, the, you know, the ratios are much better. So they're getting better care, which really was where they were doing the experimentation. And they weren't being clear with the families about that. So the families weren't even aware of these hepatitis experiments oh being God. conducted on their family members. So there so was thinking a thinking that they're consenting to better care and right, right and not getting the full picture. I mean, really, the administration and then being further isolated. So like, it's not like it sounds like they weren't really given great visitation rights or whatever. And even like when the families were pushing for improvements, are then like being blackballed essentially, right. and no one's dealing with them. It happened to doctors who worked in the facility also. Wow. Um. So there was a vaccinologist um who described the hepatitis studies performed at Willowbrook as, quote, the most unethical medical experiments ever performed on children in the United States, end quote. So it was just really, oh, really I just got horrible. Chills. I know, I just got a chill also, and I put this together. <laughs> I still reading it back is just so insane. It's haunting. Um, there was also just, like, really horrific abuse that was going on. So, like, patient to patient as well as, like, carer to patient. Yeah, I um, bet. Physical abuse, psychological abuse, sexual abuse. Um, they said from 1950 to 1980, there was an estimated 12,000 residents who died there, approximately 400 a year, which that I seems mean, low. I'm it's, 400 a year, and you have 6,300 residents yeah. with hepatitis and pneumonia and whatever, and tuberculosis and mm -hmm. everything else that's not being treated at a yeah. 200 to 1 ratio. That mm, you lied. <laughs> yes, they said that, um, and this is a this is an excerpt from a website called Crime Reads that did an article. I think the woman who wrote it actually also wrote a book about Willowbrook. Um, they said many who came to Willowbrook lived a short, brutal existence. They mm -hmm. died because of neglect, violence, lack of nutrition, and medical mis mismanagement or experimentation, and some simply disappeared or died by suicide. So it was just like really, it's like making me so sad. It's just, I'm sorry, this yeah, is such a trick. <laughs> this is such a sad episode. Um, but I think it's also important to talk about. So this House of Horrors was graphically exposed in 1972. Uh, there was a Peabody Award winning documentary. And before the days of the shirtless selfies and Al Capone Vault or Fox News... Geraldo Rivera. Oh my god. I was like, shirtless selfies, stop calling me out. <laughs> <laughs> How did you see those? Uh Geraldo Rivera. Rivera and that illustrious mustache was working when it was in play like it wasn't out of place in the 70s in 1972. No. It, it fit. <laughs> it fit. It was working for him. Oh man. Um I actually fell down like a little bit of a Geraldo rabbit hole. So he started working as an attorney. Which I didn't realize he was an attorney. So it's a peek into my future is what you're saying. <laughs> yes. Spoiler alert. Wait till you see my mustache, guys. <laughs> um, he was actually working with a Puerto Rican activist. I'm saying activist group. And like they were working for like civil rights. Um, I'm sure they were labeled as a terrorist organization. It was the Young Lords, like the Black oh, Panthers. Yeah. Um, or SNCC or whatever. Yeah. But he was also doing, like, legal services. Uh, he started working as a journalist for New York City News, and he was contacted by this Dr. Bronson, who we've mentioned a couple of times, who had recently been fired 
from the facility for pushing for improvement. Mm. Um, so he broke this Willowbrook story in 1972 with the documentary. Uh, it was called Willowbrook, The Last Disgrace, but it also covered um, a facility called Letchworth in Rockland County. Okay. Covered both of them. Letchworth sounds sounds terrible. Willowbrook sounds pleasant. Yes. It's horrible. Letchworth yes. sounds and is. like you're getting exactly what it's called. Yes. Like there's no, they're not hiding the ball on that one. Right. Um. So they actually had a scheduled time to go, but apparently uh, Bronston, Dr. Bronson gave them a key to the facility and they basically broke in and they went to, they filmed inside building six, which was one of the children's wards. Um, And they went, despite having a scheduled time, they went unannounced because they wanted to catch it the way it was. Not as the, you know, facility, not as the staff would try and, you know, clean things. Because you can actually see part of the um, video, for part of the footage from Letchworth. You can see that they had come in. He's like, you could smell bleach. Like, they were trying to clean. They were trying to, like, throw clothes on the kids and, like, put a good face on it. Yeah. They didn't get that at Willowbrook because they went unannounced. Mm, um, yeah. That I, makes sense, though. Like, you're if you're taking a guided tour, like... Trying I mean, to expose conditions. It's not at all on the same level, but like when you go to visit a college and you do a college tour, they're not showing you the oldest dorm on campus. They're showing With you the, the new dorm. Shower. Right. Right. And they're showing you the new wing of the library. Right. And, you know, like, yeah, maybe the outside of the buildings might need some sprucing up or look like they're from the 70s or mm-hmm. something. But like, oh, look at how connected our, our lecture halls all have outlets so you can plug in your laptop or whatever. <laughs> look at this. There's power. <laughs> And that's, I mean, I think it really, like, if you want to, because they're, they're labeling this as an expose. I think if you want to expose the shit out of that, you got to show up on an ounce. I, yeah, I would say that that is almost a necessary element of an yeah. expose, is that it is uh, kind of, uh, like, there's something that you surprised the subject with. Right. It's a gotcha. Yes. In the yes. words of What's-Her-Face from Parks and Rec. I always want to call oh, her Jan, but I don't think that not, that's her name. No, but she was like the anchor on yes. that that daytime <laughs> TV. The hot mess. Yeah. That, like The lady who was on Mad TV. Yes. <laughs> oh, man, I can't remember what it is. But not yes. Michael McDonald, but Michael McDonald's no. mother when he yes. was Stuart. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> the other Michael McDonald. <laughs> right. Um, so you can watch the documentary online. I will give you the heads up. It is very hard to watch. Um, but the doc... Oh, the expose. The expose. Okay, not yes. the crop, not the other one. They're both. They're both. I think they're both on YouTube, um, but it's just the cropsy one is not as difficult to watch, is what you're saying. No, I mean it's also upsetting just based on the content, um, but this is worse. What's the name of it? Um, it's called Willowbrook: The Last Disgrace. Ooh. I mean, you know, I get what you were doing with the name, but. Slightly incorrect, because there's been lots of disgraces to to come, unfortunately. So the doctor who contacted Geraldo Rivera, and they worked closely, I guess, in this, he said that the other doctors on the facility, some of the other doctors in the facility, like, organized against him. He was punished for requesting things like painkillers, soap, sheets, surgery thread for sutures instead of upholstery thread, and requesting non-rotten food for the residents under his care. So Geraldo busts in with his camera crew and just the whole time you just hear like wailing. I mean, it, it's just horrible. Um, there's not even like, they're not even offering the opportunity for these p- people, these residents to have any sort of dignity for themselves. None. Like if you're asking for sheets, Correct. their sheets must have been just blackened. I don't know if they even had sheets, to be honest. I feel like they were just sleeping on mattresses. Right. Um, and there's, there's, okay, so there's another video on YouTube that was put out by, I have the note here, the New York State Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. Um, they did a video with Geraldo Rivera and a man named Bernard Carabello, who was a patient at Willowbrook and he was interviewed in the original documentary so they did because now it has now 2022 marks 50 years since the expose oh wow so they did like a they revisited Mm -hmm. the topic and they did an interview with the two of them and I can tell you I mean Geraldo Rivera who I don't think we know as being the most 
sensitive uh, of men mm. actually got choked up talking about 50 years later what he saw. He was like, it's just like the smell was overwhelming. People just filthy. Um, and the, the sound It's just like even turning it on for a few minutes. It's just like it's hard to watch. So it obviously. And what was that again? The name of that? Oh, I don't have the name of the video, but it was done by the New York State Developmental Disabilities oh. Planning Council. Okay. Um, and you can see it on And YouTube. it was put out this year? Um, yes, it was put out earlier this year. Um, and it's a great video, and they do an interview with Bernard, who has cerebral palsy. Um, and he does, I mean, like, one of his requests in the video that they, the original documentary was like, I want to learn how to be a better reader, because he's a completely functional person. He just right. has some physical disabilities. Right, yeah. If you've never met listener, somebody who has cerebral palsy, it's a truly just simply physical um, Correct. difference. Yeah. It, it doesn't, I don't, I mean, I think it can potentially affect mm-hmm. your neurological development um, because I think it's more often than not a birth injury mm-hmm. um, as a result of um, what the the fetus or the child goes through in the birth canal, but, Mm -hmm. um, as a consequence of losing oxygen for a period of time, um, during childbirth, but so there can be some, some, uh, brain development issues, but more often than not, it isn't, it's purely physical. Yes. And he did not, I, as he, I mean, he didn't speak of any, um, diminished intellectual capacity. Right. But if you're um, never taught to read, then you don't know how to read. Like, right. And he was like in his, t- he and Geraldo Rivera were about the same age at the time. Oh, wow. And he had been there for like 15 years or something crazy oh. like that, like just such a long time. And he has since gone on to become an activist and an advocate for people with disabilities, which yeah. is some good And news. it sucks too, because there's, you know, I think it's just as likely that the families of these people patients or um, residents they could have said like uh we don't want anything to do with this person who's other Mm -hmm. or we don't know how to help this person we don't have the resources right to um modify our home so that they can get around it or or... even how like where do you even begin if you have no concept and because, like, again, folks, there was no internet back then. It's not like right. now if you find out that your child has a, a developmental disability or a physical disability, you can Google right. um, what to do and ha- what resources you can ask for at school or whatever. I mean, the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act wasn't passed until 1964. Um, so when Willowbrook opened, schools, public schools were not required to provide any sort of um, yeah. assistance to students with um, any sort of learning disability, at least, Mm -hmm. um, let alone a physical disability. So they didn't have to have ramps at school. They didn't have to have doors that were wide enough for a wheelchair to fit through. We are going to get there. Oh, shoot. Sorry. (laughs) I got ahead of myself. I did did my my law school thesis (laughs) on the IDEA Act and how it needs to be. Oh, did you? Yeah, and how it needs to be um, amended to make, uh, IEPs and 529 plans, yeah, um, or 504 plans in schools include uh, the social ramifications of those assistances that are provided to students. Because if you're providing a student with somebody to like sit with them in class to help them, it's take isolating notes, exactly, yeah. and then that creates um, a social barrier for those students where they can't develop their social skills properly because totally. they're, yeah. So I did a whole paper on that. Oh, that's really interesting. In law school. Oh, what a nice, like yeah. tie into this. Um, <laughs> so that's my soapbox <laughs> and I'm going to knock it off it for the rest of the episode. <laughs> um, obviously when the documentary was shown, people were outraged by Good. what they could see. Good job, people. Yes, it worked. <laughs> it was effective. Um, so the expose helped empower parents in addition to Dr. Bronston um, and the New York Civil Liberties Union. Uh, and they filed a federal lawsuit. And they stated that the constitutional rights of the patients had been violated. And they listed off all of the significant issues. Um, you know, indefinite confinement not releasing people that were eligible to be released, um, not conducting periodic evaluations on people and reassessing like what they need. Um, Didn't 
even provide like proper habilitation for residents. Like that should be the whole purpose why they're there. Right. Um, they didn't provide adequate educational programs like speech, occupational, physical therapy. It was overcrowded, lack of privacy. Um, so what was their lawsuit alleging? Just that they neglect? That that these constitutional rights had been violated. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I guess like life, liberty, freedom. Right. I mean, they went through like they didn't protect them from theft oh, okay. of like their Personal of their property, stuff. Yeah. I mean, they were assaulted, injured. They couldn't even provide like clothing and meals and toilets. Oh yeah. So yeah, um, unlawful search and seizure. They were confining people hospital. to their beds. Yeah. So um, um, cruel and unusual punishment. Lack of violation. compensation for work performed was another one. Oh yeah. Um, inadequate medical facilities and obviously staffing, as we discussed, was a significant issue. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, this led to a um, 1975 federal court settlement where New York agreed to establish a group home system and would move the Willowbrook residents into small group homes. And they did pledge that each individual had a constitutional right to protection from harm. Um, and like I said, they listed uh, Nelson Rockefeller as the first the first defendant in that lawsuit. Fuck that guy. Yeah, fuck that guy. Um, and I, that's what I was like, fuck that guy. And I read about a couple positive things and I was like, no, fuck that guy. No, fuck him. Because yeah, Nelson Rockefeller is from the Rockefellers yes. that had more money than God. Yes. And have had more money than God since the mid-1800s, yes. if I'm recalling correctly. Yeah. Fuck them all. Fuck them. Like, Rockefellers, Roosevelt's, uh, all of them. All of them. Fuck them. Um, so, disabilityjustice.org, which has an article about the closure of Willowbrook, stated... This case set important precedents for the humane and ethical treatment of people with developmental disabilities living in institutions. This, in turn, served as the impetus for accelerating the pace of community placements for people with developmental disabilities, expanding community services, increasing the quality and availability of day programs, and establishing the right of children with disabilities to a public education. So this laid the groundwork for national reform in the care, education, and housing of people with developmental disabilities, such as the Protection and Advocacy System and the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act, which was in 1975, the Education for All, and again, this is a dated phrase, for All Handicapped Children Act in 1975, and the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act in 1980. So those being passed... Um, that was the first federal civil rights laws protecting people with disabilities, which then led to the enactment of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so ultimately, the fallout did have long lasting, really solid protections that were put in place. Um, multiple former patients have gone to have careers in advocacy work. Um, unfortunately, Many of the residents who are still alive today are still enduring mistreatment. The New York Times did an investigation that found in 2020 there were 97 allegations of physical abuse against alumni, according to internal state records. They said there's 23 residents that are, or alumni, I should say, that are still alive today. So unfortunately, we still have a long way to go. So the 23 former residents of Willowbrook There were, so they went from having like almost 6,500 people in this facility. They had the federal lawsuit, which required them to get their number down to 250 in this facility and everybody else needed to be in a group home setting. So they, they shifted everybody to group homes. And as of 2020, 2,300 of the people who were former residents were still living, 97 allegations of abuse against alumni were made. Oh, from the 2300. Yes. I thought you said 23. And so I was oh, like, no. 23 people have 97. Oh my God. That's what? <laughs> no. Um, okay. <laughs> there was 97 allegations of physical abuse against alumni. That um, were ongoing. Yes. Yeah. In these group home settings. So obviously there from was. From staff or from other. Unclear. Persons. It didn't specify. Okay. It just said that there were allegations Not of that abuse. one is better than the other, right. but. Um. So I think we can all agree, obviously, there is a long way to go. 
in the United States on many fronts, but definitely disability rights, mental health services and access, ableism in general. Um, I think Willowbrook does give us some perspective on how much has changed in 50 years and that you Mm. can go from being a Puerto Rican activist to a Fox News pundit. We don't really know how that happens, but uh, the campus now (laughs) is used by the College of Staten Island, and they actually put in a walking route called the Willowbrook Mile where they still have some of the building standing that they aren't using, and you can walk a loop, and it has a, a... a series of signs that are up that talk about what happened to increase awareness so that people understand, you know, what happened there and kind of explaining the story. Oh man, you go there at night though, you're going to go to Gettysburg. spooky. Yeah. And that's one of the big things, like all those urban legends, there's constantly like teenagers breaking oh, I'm sure. in there and, you know, scaring each other and, um, you know, all of that. Totally. I mean, it's got to be haunted as fuck in those buildings. Oh yeah. Like, like there's just terrifying. no way. Like um, that much trauma in a single building like if you oh, follow the bad. stone is it the stone theory or stone placement theory and it's basically like your energy passes to the building and that's why like certain spirits can't leave a building and then like other spirits can like attach to a person i don't like any of that information um so on this <laughs> in this research uh <laughs> you wanted I, a spooky <laughs> episode folks you got you're it getting it <laughs> You'll never look at a stone the same way again. (laughs) Um, I did take some ADHD side quests in researching this. Um, The Rockefellers, obviously, and Nelson Rockefeller did some research on them. I'll be honest, most of my side questing involved Geraldo Rivera. uh, That's reasonable. That mustache is distracting. Um, Not your fault. I'm going to tell you the list of things I had about side quests that I took about Geraldo Rivera. Okay. Um, career and social media, shirtless Geraldo pics. Uh, then I started looking for orange Geraldo glasses because he always wears these orange glasses. But also, he is 79 years old. I know. Wild. He's had work done for sure. I I don't know. But you know what? You're going to get the shirtless selfie picture so you can make that determination on your own. All right. Um, I wonder if he had peck implants. I don't think so. I got to be honest. Like... I was Googling, obviously I've done a lot of Geraldo Rivera Googling, not that anybody asked me to or I need to. You're going to get some weird targeted ads next week. Yeah, he, I mean, I'll say, even though he's the worst on a lot of fronts, like, he he did, uh, what he did was important, and it it really was, even though Jane Curtin was doing it the full year before, trying to expose it, who's going to listen to a 21-year-old woman who's a journalist writing in the the Staten Island Advance, Um, but he really... Broke. Yeah, I mean, he had the video footage and the the gotcha, and she had a photographer that was coming in with her too, but it yeah. just wasn't enough, and it didn't get the the platform where you have New York News going in and showing to all five boroughs, and then you yeah. know where and what I think other regional... yeah, there's something to be said for the yeah, you know, photos are devastating. I mean, mm-hmm. there's so many photos throughout history from World War II that are devastating photos. Right. Um, but the video footage, I think, makes it so much more visceral. Totally. Especially if... The sounds. I would, yeah, if the sounds, I think... Um, I'm not, I don't want to say, like, sold it, but I think it made it a lot more difficult for the public to ignore. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're panning across a room, and there's just, like... There's just kids just sitting, just completely, you can tell, like, complete social deprivation. Yeah. Like, in various states of dress or completely naked, sitting in a, in a corner by themselves, like, stimming. I mean, like, yeah. no no clothing, no food, like, the basic. And things that you expect kids basic to care. do where they just play. Like, right. they don't know how to play because right. there's. Doesn't sound like there was anything to play with. No. I mean, yeah. it was like, you know, here's a toilet that doesn't work and no toothbrushes. I right. mean, it but just... We'll give you some hepatitis poo. Yeah, yeah, but here, would you like an injection of hepatitis that we can fully experiment on? It's just like, it's just so awful. Yeah. Um, so I'll shit on Geraldo Rivera all day, but I will hand two things to him. One, he looks good for 79. And two, he really helped draw attention to something that desperately needed attention drawn to it. Mm. And ultimately wound up helping 
people with developmental disabilities nationwide. And I th- I'm assuming ultimately like on an international basis, because I don't think there was a lot of places where they were passing civil rights laws for, yeah. adult, you know, people with disabilities. Well, and I wonder, um, I have no reason to think that this was one of your rabbit holes, but I know that, um, you know, Rosemary Kennedy was the impetus oh. behind um, the Special Olympics. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't? No. Yeah. Um, their sister mm-hmm. uh, founded the Special Olympics in Rosemary's honor. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, but I'm wondering, because there's also the Paralympics right. for folks who have uh, physical differences but are don't have a developmental delay or mm-hmm. disability. Um, and I wonder if when this came out, they made that change of having the Special Olympics and the Paralympics. Oh. As being different um, items, or if they were grouped together like they were at Willowbrook. Yeah. Um, because the needs of those groups are different. Right. Um, you know, right. if somebody needs, um, it's that thing, that image of um, the three people standing at a fence to watch a baseball game, and one is really short, one is like medium height, and the other one is tall. So the tall person can see over the fence, no yeah. problem. The medium person can see if they, like, stand on their tiptoes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the short person can't see anything. And it's... Yes, relatable. Can't yeah. See anything. <laughs> Never can but see. But <laughs> it's the message of this is, like, they show... They're, they're like, okay, equality. Mm-hmm. Everybody gets the same size step stool. Step stool. And the short person still can't see. Yeah. The, the middle person can now see comfortably. And the tall person who didn't have a problem before. They're like, now, great. Right. They're like, cool. Now I can block other people. Right. So, and so they were like, equality does not always equal equity. Right. And then they, the last image is the, sh- the shortest person on a really tall step stool so that they are seeing over the fence in the same height as everybody else mm-hmm. and able then to interact with the, their peers. Right. In the same way. And it's that kind of thing where, like, like it's the goal is equity, not equality. And, yes. And yeah, like one size fits all is not right. It just it just doesn't work. Right. Like there's some things, especially when it comes to like something like a standard of care or adjustments that need to be made or you know something that's available in the facility is a there's vast differences and it's a it's a diverse you know, set of diagnoses that are putting people in these situations. And I mean, especially when you look at the fact that it's not just developmental disabilities that was putting people in Willowbrook. It was physical disabilities. It was mental illness. Yeah. People that families really didn't know what to do with are dropping them off at Willowbrook because they either don't have the resources, don't have the education, don't know where to turn. And let's, yeah, like let's consider in the 1940s, being homosexual was considered a mental illness. Right. So, like, what what are you going to do, you know? Like, where's the line? Right. So then somebody yes. who's who's homosexual is thrown into a hospitalized setting with people who, potentially people who have dangerous mental illnesses, like mm-hmm. schizoaffective disorder or um, sociopathies of different types. Right. And then you have, apparently... Or being not being treated. They're not being treated. Not not even having f- like basic physical needs taken care right. of, which exacerbates has to exacerbate your mental symptoms. Illness. Yeah. Right. So it's it's really just it's like compounding the worst yeah. of the worst of the worst. And I actually heard something recently I was listening to Sawbones and they were talking about a mental illness diagnosis, but mm, yeah. they kind of explained it like every mental illness diagnosis is really a spectrum of symptoms and some people have this many some people have this many you know it kind of varies person to person how things represent um but that like everything should be viewed as being a spectrum which i think is completely true you said in like what episode two (laughs) yes and every episode since then everything is like a spectrum of diagnoses so the fact that they were approaching everything with this just universal neglect we have human a who has depression, we'll say, mm-hmm. um, they're, they're going to be treated exactly the same as human B who has bipolar disorder mm-hmm. and has manic episodes. And um, so whether those treatments should be the same for those people or not mm-hmm. is irrelevant. Right. Um, a person who gives birth and suffers postpartum depression um, will be treated the same as somebody who has 
crippling anxiety and agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you, but you can't do, like, they were treating it as mental illness, the one thing, rather than mental illness, the genre of things that can Right, with, like, different flavors under the same. Right. And they, there was one point where I was reading, I don't know if it was during the the lawsuit leading up to, I think it might have been leading up to the lawsuit. The parents contacted a doctor in, I want to say, California, who was running a more modern facility, and especially modern when we look at how people are treated now, um, night and day from Willowbrook, and they asked him to like come in and evaluate and like consult like what is your opinion and he was horrified like I can't believe we're still doing this like in California we've already been doing you know group home settings and you know this and like listing off all these different practices that were just light years beyond what they were doing in Willowbrooks like not only was it wild because New York is I mean usually living here we're at least told, right? We're so progressive. We're on the yes. front lines of it's very strange scientific advancement. Blah blah blah. Because we really like politically, socially, we usually are not like the cutting edge, but like we're usually ahead of the curve when it comes to mm-hmm. to changes like that. Um, this was just I don't know if I I think it was just like the perfect storm. Yeah. Of the, the where the campus was. Yeah, that's the true. way it was laid out. And and I think it just like snowball. Yeah. And then, you know, when you get to the point where it's like, well, things are so bad, we might as well start experimenting on people and the government's going to pay us to do it. That's w- what Insane. has happened. And like you said, there is those between Staten Island in general being viewed as like the dumping ground for New York City. Mm-hmm. And then you have mafia ties and presence on Staten Island Mm -hmm. and everything that goes along with that. And then because it was so isolated, the workers created their own hierarchy and there's that black market thing and it creates these layers of situations where then when you start to complain, if you are able to articulate, you you went there after you had finished maybe primary school. Mm -hmm. Um and you're able to say, like, uh, excuse you, I'm hungry and right. filthy and I would like a shower, please. What the hell? Yeah. Um, then they're like, oh, well, it's too bad that your family doesn't love you because you didn't get any mail. And yeah. so then they just shut you down. Also, the showers don't work. And neither right. the toilets. Right. And also, we don't have clothes for you. Or food. Which, who knows even if those were broken or if they just shut off the water to yeah. save money. Right. Yeah. It's It's just like... I think it really was the perfect storm, and I think something so isolated and secluded was just allowed to fester for a really long time. And yeah. ultimately, I want to say it took another... Yeah, because they were open for... 30, 15 years after... 30 years before um, Geraldo did his thing, 25 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. And, and my understanding um, in speaking to like family that worked there was even early on, it was bad. It's so, like, I don't think it was ever good. I think so it was just... Your grandma worked there when it, like, first opened? Yeah, I want to say... I want to say she was, like, a teenager. Oh, so wow. it would have been, like, earlier in the opening, and it was, like, not good then. So I think That's really it was, like, the perfect storm. Yeah. You just had a place that, you know... What is that expression about, like, things growing in the dark? Something about lies and mushrooms? I don't know. I don't remember what it is. Oh, um, but like, you know, if you, when the light of day is not shining and you don't have outside people to be like, what the fuck is going on here? Right. You know, things like that get worse. And it's just, it's just a really horrible story. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to say that there was some good that came from it, but really at the expense of so thousands many, of yeah. people and families. And that's the other thing that I think always baffles me with any of these stories about old timey, horrible hospitals is the overpopulation issue and like just say you don't have space like I don't understand right what the like what do you think is gonna happen instead like I don't just say you don't have room I don't know if it's like a funding thing like are they getting more funding based on bodies versus like is it who's paying attention to capacity so I I think ultimately you know you've got situations too where when you don't have a lot of oversight and yeah. you're boxing out people you know families that are complaining and you're 
I mean, running experiments and you're getting state funding, you know, at a certain point, are you just getting more money for more bodies? And is that what the, what that the is, goal it's is? It's so wild that the state owned and run hospital was side funded by the Department of Justice. Nuts. Like. Department of Defense. Department of Defense. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. DOJ. I mean, not really, but, you know. <laughs> Sorry, Department of Defense. Um, I might have said Department of Justice earlier when I screamed about cutting their budget, but <laughs> mm. Department of Defense budget is currently, I think, a trillion dollars or something ridiculous. And if you think it's not going to experiments like this, then you are high as fuck. Well, and also a perfect example of like, you know, when people will screech like, okay, we're giving, you know, how many trillions of dollars to the military? How much are we giving to schools? Right. You're cutting funding from kids and you have kids that were wind up in winding up in this horrific setting right. where they weren't separating kids from adults. And it's not like the DOD budget is going to those trillions of dollars is going to building better schools on base for the families of service members. Hell no. Or increasing the salaries of service members. No, they're or... just poisoning your drinking water on yeah. base. I mean it's it's really uh, evil and there was a lot of evil that happened at Willowbrook. I'm glad that it's closed. That's not to say that, you know, that evil has not spilled over into other settings and that people are still experiencing unspeakable things. Um, but hopefully we're still headed in a direction where ultimately things will improve and things have generally, I mean, speaking very broadly improved, but that's also because the bar was ankle high on this. Totally. Um, so that that was uh, Willowbrook. Very yeah. upsetting. So sorry to be a drag this week, but I think it's also an important story to talk about. If you stuck in this long, thank you so much. And we'll be back next week, back on our regular bullshit, I think. Yeah, well, I think we'll be going back to some ADHD things. And definitely keep letting us know, I mean, stuff you want us to talk yeah, about. and anything that you're interested in, guys, we are very open to it. Um, Especially mental health stuff. I'm such a nerd about that. Yeah, we love, we love a good hyperfixation tangent. Yeah. Uh, so, no problem. Oh, I did have a couple ADHD wins we can talk about. Oh. Recently. Yeah. Um, I, good, that'll be a nice way to a end nice, it. Yeah, yeah, I was just yeah, thinking yeah. that to myself. Um, I took a day a couple of weeks ago. I actually texted you, but I did it because I was so pumped. And I went through and just, like, rescheduled all the things I needed to reschedule, called and asked questions about the things I had to ask questions about, just shit that I had been kicking down the road for a couple of months that I didn't want to take care of that were just like nagging me yeah. I took care of and oh man it felt so good that's nice so nice that was my little ADHD win also uh realizing that dry erase boards are way more effective for me than writing things down on paper mm. so I've been replacing everything with dry erase uh so that's my other win that is nice yeah my win is um I did get my new planner Woo-hoo. um that I I did post a reel of it on our Instagram page because I was so excited. They're great and planners. Got low key called out by a different uh, ADHD account. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm excited to use this planner. I think the layout will really work for me because mm-hmm. um, there's a, a page within each weekly spread. The week is on one side of the the book and then on the other opposite page is a page to like take notes and jot things down and keep lists so yes which is great um yeah because more often than not in planners in the past I've had to I mean I'm a post-it fiend but I I have post-its all over my other planner Mm -hmm. from different like grocery lists or whatever you know you know listener you just (laughs) you just write something down so that you get it out of your head and and then you you move on with what you're thinking about get overwhelmed because you have 400 sticky notes and they're all for different things and in my past planners there wasn't I really don't need to write my full day schedule in my calendar it's Mm -hmm. truly just reminders appointment here yeah recording then whatever um, things like that. So I don't need that much space on each day, but I do like to have a weekly spread in addition to the monthly spread. Same. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very excited that I, I finally did that. Also, I finally, (laughs) you'll be proud of me, listener. I did finally get like a skincare routine. So I have a night cream that I've used every night this week, except for one night when I forgot. Um, and a a separate one to use in the mornings Mm -hmm. and I've been doing it so far. It's good. Your skin looks good. 
Does it? Yeah. Have you noticed? Good. Yeah, it looks good. Um, it feels much better, especially on my eyes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've done that every night this week. So I'm very glad that I've kept up with that and mm-hmm. not um, given up. So I set it up in front of my face when I'm at my, <laughs> like I set up my meds. It's right yeah. in front of my face in my bathroom. <laughs> I will say like in re-skincare and ADHD, like a workaround for me. So sometimes at night I, I just want to like, you know, roll into bed and like not do anything. Yeah. I have like a oil that I use that if I just like quick, like wash my face and throw that oil on instead of going through, like normally I would be doing like a serum and eye cream and a moisturizer. Instead of doing those three steps, I'll just do the oil. And that's like my shortcut if I'm not up to that. Oh. And it also just smells so good and it feels so good on my skin. And I just, every time I put it on, it literally, I'm like, mm. <laughs> It just is like so, oh, it smells good. I actually saw something on Reddit today uh, before I came over where somebody has like on their nightstand, like those Colgate wisps, Mm -hmm. like the, it's like a, oh yeah, like the tiny little little mini toothbrush toothbrush with a little bit of toothpaste in it. Yep. That little like pick flossers Mm -hmm. and um, a packet of um, like makeup removing wipes. That's a really so that good idea. They just have that on their nightstand yep. for when they like get into bed and have forgotten to do those things or uh, don't feel like getting back out of bed. Because what a terrible go- feeling. Right. Getting comfy. Especially washing my face. Like that is something because yeah. I don't wear makeup too often. Mm-hmm. These like it's very like I'll do like full makeup one day and the next day I look like a crypt keeper. <laughs> Not now with my new skincare. Yeah, routine. which is why the eye cream, I was really like, okay, you got to <laughs> battle these <Ooh. laughs> these under eye circles are, are getting deep. <laughs> Have you seen that, the meme, and it's a little kid like with his head down, he's got the real big bags under his eyes. Somebody was like, you look tired. And it's like me looking back at them with these giant <laughs> eye bags. I looked at myself in the mirror the other day and I was like, oh. Is it a cartoon kid? Yeah. I think it's the kid from um, Meet the Robinsons. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. With the dark hair. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's what that made me think of, the eye bags. That is a cute movie if you haven't watched it. I don't think I've seen that. Oh, it is. It's really cute, honestly. We are going to take no further recommendations from Katie until she sees Madagascar. <laughs> that is a cornerstone of animated films. Got to tune into our Patreon, guys, because... Oh, yeah. Did we talk about that on Yeah. Patreon? Our animal yeah. side quest was... <laughs> Katie hasn't seen it at Madagascar, and that's a travesty. So everybody needs to bully her into seeing it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to keep bullying my spouse into seeing Emperor's New Groove, and that's she's going to bully PK into Hocus Pocus eventually, the first mm. one. Oh, have you seen the second one? I did. Yeah, it's cute, it right? It is I really cute. I liked it. Yeah. I thought they did a good job. I'm normally not into sequels, but... I thought they did a really good job of, like, incorporating it. I agree. My biggest beef, uh, (laughs) because I did have one, beef, which... Also on Patreon. Also on Patreon. You should tune in, and I've been using the word beef a lot lately. um, For a vegetarian, especially. (laughs) uh, Is when they did the, you know, like, when they performed and they had the song, they didn't do the Spell on You song, which I thought was lame. Oh, you wanted them to redo that song? Yeah, because I think it's, like, so perfect. Yeah, that's true. So that was my only, that was my only beef, though, of the whole movie. Um, yeah, I didn't mind it at all. My, I would say that the only thing that, like, kind of annoyed me was the little girl version of Winifred, Mm -hmm. um, was kind of cartoony. Yes. A little bit more cartoony than I would have liked. I lied. I have one other beef. Okay. Sarah Jessica Parker's eye makeup was bad. They, Mm, she, she got a raw one on that and they did a bad job. I think, yeah, they, they, I think they tried to make it look kind of more modern maybe or something they did it it should have been a smoky eye with a heavy eyebrow and that's it and yeah. somehow they were like linked and she just looked bad yeah for somebody who's like beautiful yeah she's stunning she looked yeah. she looked it looked weird mm-hmm. so yeah that, those are my beats. i did love kathy najimi on the roombas though <laughs> oh my god it was very funny <laughs> they have a mind of their own <laughs> She's like trying to balance on two of them. Yeah, I laughed pretty hard at that. That was a good. Yeah, one. but no, I thought the whole thing was very cute. I saw initially some hot takes on uh, Facebook when it first dropped, mm-hmm. and you know, some people had watched it like right away, and we had our launch party, mm-hmm. um, so uh, we hadn't seen it, and so um, the hot takes were like, "Well, it was fine." 
da da da. Like it, it is what it is. Like for what it was meant to be. And I thought the ending was right. Just, so then, what is your? What I is thought your the ending was exquisite. I thought. Did the you whole... see the bonus feature at the end? No. Yeah, they set it up for another one, which I'm like kind of annoyed about because then mm. I'm like, you're gonna ruin it if you do too many of them. Yeah. Like That's... thirty years in between and doing this, like I'm into it. The third one, I'm not gonna. I'm not into that. Yeah, I feel like that that's is annoying. Ruin it. Maybe that's why they were like, Meh. yeah. But uh, yeah. So if you, if you just stop when the credits stop, and you're fine. Then you're fine. Uh, and that whole thing with the singing in the in the recording booth was cringy anyway. So just turn that off. Yeah, that was annoying. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, and that I guess maybe that was the only other thing because I kind of felt like they were. It's like they were about to make it into a musical. Yeah, and then turned away from it Couldn't at the last second yeah. yeah that was the only thing where i was like okay whatever but mm-hmm. um buster uh Bluth oh was spot on Good hysterical choice. yeah um yeah no i loved i loved the message of it i thought yeah. it was a very sweet message um not as dark as the old one no actually my and my facebook memories today was <laughs> me saying I know that it's supposed to be a kids' movie, but the intro to Hocus Pocus always gives me the heebie-jeebies. Oh my god! <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I do struggle with scary movies. Call guys. back to the <laughs> opening of this episode when Katie was like, "Oh, if it's the opening credits and it's like this or a trailer, I'm not gonna watch it." <laughs> Hocus Pocus almost got her. Okay. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I'm a tenderoni. It's just true. Just a tortellini filled with knives. <laughs> just afraid of scary movies. So my ADHD win is being able to loop loop us back to the beginning of the episode. Look at that. <laughs> it's a perfect circle. <laughs> well, thanks for tuning in. Um, and we will see you next week for our regularly... Why did I have a hard time with that? Regular... Whoa, that was worse. Don't worry, you got better. <laughs> our scheduled programming. <laughs> our typical (laughs) scheduled programming next week. Mm, Yeah. And uh, remember to be kind because sometimes the world is garbage. And the bar is ankle high. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be here next Thursday with a brand new episode to delight your brain juices. In the meantime, the best way to support us is to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast streaming platform. You can keep up with us during the week on Instagram and Facebook at The Bar is Ankle High and on Twitter at Ankle High Pod. If you want even more Ankle High hot takes in your life and have a few dollars to spare, consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash The Bar is Ankle High. We post bonus episodes there full of our karaoke attempts, Am I the Asshole discussions, and wondering how we even managed to survive this long. Patreon subscribers also get exclusive access to our secret Patreon-only Facebook group and get added to our close friends list on Instagram. Until next week, remember to be kind to yourself because the bar is ankle high.